Hi, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Don't forget to also share, like, and comment. And welcome to today's conversation podcast. We have decided to have a special program about the state of our country. And I've brought back um, Mr. John Sangwa, State Council, to help me discuss these matters. Mr. Sangwa, I promised that I'll bring you back for a special program. And I'd stated that you'd be a regular analyst on matters that rise where we may require your input. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. The Oasis Forum recently launched, relaunched. The Zambian people may remember the Oasis Forum comprising the Law Association of Zambia, uh, NGOCC, and the three church mother bodies. At the time, I think it was the Zambia Episcopal Conference, the Evangelical Fellowship of Zambia, and the Christian Churches, the Christian Council of Churches in Zambia. They were put together to protest against uh, perceived changes that were to take place to facilitate Dr. Chulubaza, then you know, our second president, return for through a third term and mm -hmm. constitutional amendment. So they were very instrumental in coordinating dissent and coordinating opposition of the constitutional amendments because they thought it was personal, selfish, and also raised other matters, governance matters, and they became a very strong uh, voice in our country. But over the years, they put that out, they put that out. They are back. They announced last week that they are back, and they are saying, number one, they want to ensure that the new constitutional making process is um, inclusive, is people-driven, and allows all stakeholders. Secondly, they are worried about the state of our country. They are worried about governance and governance issues and um, how we are proceeding. Thirdly, they are worried about the rule of law. So I've brought you, these are constitutional matters. You have a long history in these matters, and I thought we could begin from there. Okay. We need a new constitution. No, you don't. Um, you know, the, the issues they are talking about, I think, is what has caused uh, problems in this country in the sense that uh, sometimes we choose not to grow, okay? We continue to talk about the same things and so forth, you know? But as a country, uh, you know, you have to get worried when uh, civil society is now beginning to behave like uh, politicians, because politicians rarely grow anyway. <laughs> but uh, civil society has to move with the time. If you ask me, do we need a new constitution? The answer is that, no, we don't need a new constitution. And there's a reason for that. Previous presidents, um, starting with Dr. Chiluva, have to sat They had the reason to advocate for a new constitution. If I may just go back into history, just slightly, but it's always important to have reference to uh, to history, because you can't discuss the present without uh, reference to the past. Now, in 1991, uh, when we made um, a transition from one-party state to a multi-party state, there was a general understanding that we needed a new constitution, because you're talking about differences, different political systems, one-party system, and now you have accepted to have a multi-party system. So a one-party constitution cannot support a multi-party uh, system of government. And the other point to also recognize is that you don't just wake up one morning to say, we need a new constitution. No, you don't. You know, constitution making is something that is done at certain historical times. It's not something that you do every day. I've read a statement where they say there is need for a new roadmap. Now, first of all, who taught them that the country needs a new constitution? Why did they arrive at the decision that there is need for a, uh, for, 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 for a, for a new roadmap? Mr. Sangwa, they, they've arrived at that. I think they've, they've seen the maneuvers from the executive 
as soon as um, the Minister of Justice, Mulambe Aimbe, was appointed, mm. he said he was setting up a, a technical team at Ministry of Justice to look into the uh, issues that may require constitutional amendments. Mm. There have been movements in Parliament. Mm. Uh, the Speaker wrote to members of Parliament and stated that um, she wanted them to propose what it, she termed non-contentious issues for possible amendments. Mm. Uh, many of us, I think even including you, oppose that because mm. the Parliament is, uh, is a creature. It can't begin to create itself yeah. And then there have been subsequent statements from the Ministry of Justice and Mulambe in particular, where he keeps on talking about the progress they are making on the need for a new constitution. Yeah. So coming from that place where the public pronouncement and where Parliament has attempted also to inform the MPs that there may be amendments to non-contentious issues and even invite them to propose mm. their own. Yeah. This must alarm you too. And as as they, 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 they do. Think. Yes, they, of course they do. But the point is that, first of all, there are two different issues that we have to discuss. But there is amendment of the constitution and there is a, a making of a new constitution. Those are two different processes together. Okay? Now, the process of amending the constitution is the responsibility of parliament. Okay? The process of making a new constitution is not the responsibility of parliament. It is the responsibility of the people. Okay? Now, those that are talking about uh, a, a, a roadmap, if you want to make a new constitution, there is already a roadmap under the current constitution. Oh, what's yes. a roadmap? You know, this is where sometimes people don't read. Yeah. Okay? The, the Constitution as amended in 2016 clearly sets out in Article 5, I think Article 5, 4, not only does it talk about the amendment of the Constitution, it also talks about issues that are exclusively reserved for the people. Okay? So, in Article 5, the Constitution proceeds on the premise that the ultimate authority in this country, reserves collectively in the Zambian people. But this authority has been delegated to various bodies. For example, the responsibility of parliament is to make laws, the responsibility of, uh, of the executive branch of government is, for example, is to govern the country by, through, by formulating policies and implementing them. Then you have the responsibility of the judiciary, which is to adjudicate. So power is already divided. That is what the Constitution does. And power has also been vested in various other institutional bodies. Then the Constitution provides that power, which has not been exclusive, expressly vested in any institution, that power is reserved to the people. Mm. Okay, so power, the residue, what has not been given, the residue rests with the people. Now are the people to exercise this? It is through a referendum. And that referendum has to be provided for. Now, if you check the constitution, nowhere does the constitution provide for constitutional making. Mm. The constitution does not provide for constitutional making, but it provides for its amendment. If you are talking about amendment of the constitution, you make reference to Article 79. It is very clear on the procedure to follow for the amendment of the constitution. But for constitution making, that is not provided for. That is the residue. That authority is not vested in a political party. That power is vested collectively in us. And the only way we can exercise that power is through a referendum. So that is already provided for. So you do not need a roadmap. I don't know what, what they even mean by roadmap, because it is very clear. Mm. If you have to make a new constitution, you have to, uh, the process has to be prescribed in an act of parliament. And that, and that act of parliament shall, should provide for a referendum at the end of the day so that the citizens have a say. 
But there is another reason why this particular discussion is basically redundant, mm -hmm. okay, in the sense that, first of all, um, you don't undertake these discussions in a vacuum. What's up? My name is Ken Dumbo, the MC with the sauce. Don't forget to subscribe to Jeku. If I may ask you, Ambassador, what is the most pressing need of a Zambian today? Economic issues. Exactly. Who is interested in the Constitution? Who? Mm. First of all, even when you advocate for an issue, you don't do it in a vacuum. And that is why constitution making, constitutional amendment is taken at a certain periodical time when people are focusing on that. In fact, in my view, it is even irresponsible to talk about constitution making or even constitutional amendment for a country that just lost nearly a thousand people from cholera not long ago. For a country that is um, uh, right now facing serious issues of drought, where there are some of the citizens cannot even afford to eat, people are looking for the staple food. And then uh, you have a president who says you should try a cassava meal. Brush their candle. The previous government was spent for the present candle. It stays in the But again, all these are irresponsible statements, but it goes to show how misguided the priorities are. And most importantly, this is a broke country. The country is broke. We have just gone through the process of built restructuring. Now, any responsible uh, country that is in a position of Zambia is to have its priorities set correctly. Okay, there are these pressing issues to deal with that, mean, meaning that uh, whatever resources you have, you have to spend them responsibly. If you are talking about constitution making, that it will involve money. Where is that money going to come from? Because you're broke as a country. So I think it is important to be able to look at the fact that, first of all, we don't need a new constitution, okay, because already that constitution was... Um, uh, because the constitution-making process, Ambassador, we completed that exercise in 2016. Mm. Okay? We struggled from to 1991 trying to make a constitution. That process ended in 2016. We may not like where we ended, but unfortunately, that is where we ended. Let me just explain a little bit. Yeah. Why do I say it ended in 2016? It's very simple. 1991, when we made a transition from one party rule to multi party, we had the 1991 constitution. Now, that constitution was a compromise constitution because the original text was determined by UNIP alone, and MMD threatened to boycott the election of 1991. So, as a compromise, we had that constitution of 1991. Then the general understanding was, after the election, in the event that MMD wins, we'll embark on a new constitution-making exercise because the 1991 was a compromise. Mm. And you remember, it took three years for, for uh, President Chilva to appoint the Manakato Constitution Commission. The mandate of the commission was very clear, come up with a new constitution. Mm. But halfway through, that process was aborted. It resulted in the amendment of the constitution in of 1996, and some of the controversial uh, clauses mm -hmm. like uh, running counter from contesting. That process of, of making a new constitution was aborted in 20, uh, uh, 1996. Mm -hmm. When President Manawasa came to office, he said, no, we didn't finish that process. We need a new, cons a new process. That is how President Manawasa appointed the Mungomba Constitution Commission. Mungomba provided its report in 2005, and that report, Monawasa decided to say it should go to the uh, Constitutional Conference, yeah. if you remember. There was a right. of the Constituent Assembly. Constituent Assembly, mm -hmm. President Monawasa decided, no, we don't need a Constituent Assembly, we need a the Constitutional Conference. Mm -hmm. The draft to Constitution was taken to the Constitutional Conference, yeah. and it came up. And unfortunately, Monawasa died in 2000. And, uh, Wait, yeah. then that was carried over by President, President Rupia Banda. Yes, yes. That process collapsed. 
in parliament. In parliament. Mm. When President Sata came into office, it simply said, oh, that process, we didn't complete it. Mm. That's when in 2012, he appointed the technical committee. We didn't appoint a commission, but he appointed a technical committee because they said, listen, there is already enough material for us to come up with a brilliant, with a good constitution. And that is how they put together that uh, technical committee. Technical committee's first order of business was to draft a fresh constitution based on the materials that had already been generated over well, the years. Mm. If you look at the draft constitution that came up, uh, that the technical committee came up with, was the most widely debated instrument than any other previous draft constitution. Mm. Because that technical committee took they created what they were calling uh, district um, uh, assemblies, yeah. provincial assemblies, where these draft constitutions were actually discussed in all the provinces. Based on the response from the provinces and from the districts, because discussion from the district were elevated to the to provinces, the then the provinces were now sent their comments. If you read the technical committee's report, it is very clear but what was said in each particular province or district on each and every clause. Mm -hmm. Based on the, those responses, we now came up with the final text of the constitution. But as you know, when President Sata died, the process died a little bit. Mm -hmm. Then when we came close to the 2016 election, you remember the constitution making became an issue yeah. where uh, the current president said, when I'm elected, I'm going to put in a new constitution. Yes. When President Lungu was already president, said, Me, I'm not promising. I will do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's how everything was revived. Then, if you remember, Dr. Simbiakla was the Minister of Justice. Mm -hmm. He now said, Okay, the first chapter draft constitution, which had been prepared by the technical committee, he said, Okay. And if you remember, there was discussion where UPND was demanding that the next election should be held not on the first past the post system, but on 50 plus 50 one. plus one. To achieve that, you needed to amend the constitution before the 2016 mm. election. So Dr. Simbiakla decided that we are going to introduce this constitution in two phases. Mm. The first phase involved all the provisions that were non entrenched. Now, so they split them into two. The entrenched provision were now to be subjected to a referendum which was going to coincide with the election of 2016. This is how parties agreed. Mm. Now, if you look at the composition of You're the. You're speaking to an ordinary audience when you say clauses that are entrenched, yes. what does that mean? Yes. Okay. There are clauses that are entrenched, meaning that in a, first of all, to amend the constitution, you need two thirds majority, two thirds for the members of parliament. Mm. Okay, not even those attending, whether they, 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 but just look at the number. If it is 150 at that time, you need a two thirds for the bill to pass. For the entrenched provision, in addition, you needed to take it to a referendum. That is how the constitution, parts of the constitution are structured. Yeah. Some can be amended with a two-thirds majority in parliament. in parliament. Others, like the Bureau, Bill of Rights and Article 79 itself, you need a referendum in addition to that. Mm -hmm. So you can get your two-thirds, the referendum meaning that the people have to participate. If the referendum does not pass, then the whole thing dies. Mm -hmm. So if I would urge those that are interested yeah. take the parliamentary debates of December 2015. Uh, you will find that there is very extensive debate between, now remember, PF did not have a two thirds mm -hmm. majority. No. So it needed the support of UPNT. You will find that there is a debate on most of the clauses between uh, UPND MPs and and peace. Mm. Whatever clauses that, that were, some clauses were actually rejected mm. jointly 
For example, the original text of the of the draft constitution provided to say that uh, uh, the president should be able to appoint cabinet from outside, outside parliament. 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 Mm. Both UPN mm. and PF rejected that. Mm. There was an issue of proportional representation. Okay, that measure was equally rejected by both PF and UPN. PND. So the final instrument that President Lungu signed on the 5th of January 2016 was a bipartisan document supported by both UPND and both. Now, Ambassador, if you have a byproduct, a, a bipartisan product, what reason then do you have to amend it? What's up? My name is Ken Dumbo, the MC with the sauce. Don't forget to subscribe to Jeku. This is the same reason that we oppose Bill 10. The same reasons we oppose Bill 10 are the same reasons that we have to oppose any attempt to amend the constitution by UPND, because that is a bipartisan instrument. Mm -hmm. No single political party can claim ownership of that amendment of the constitution in 2016. That was a bipartisan product. Now, you cannot therefore, because you are in power today, you want to change because it suits you. No. Because that was what came out. Now, for part two, part two which involved the Bill of Rights. Part three. Uh, uh, no, part two now. But the, the second part of the amendment of the Constitution. Oh, okay, yes. 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 Mm. I was one of the few lawyers who went around, the, I think, around Lusaka uh, to try and, uh, on various platforms, trying to advocate, encourage people to vote yes in favor of the bill. Mm. UPND after supporting it in parliament, yes, because it didn't have the two-thirds majority, passing it in parliament in their official campaign, campaigned against the uh, adoption of the Bill of Rights. Yeah, yeah. Which referendum failed. That referendum failed. Mm. When it failed, that was the choice of the people. Okay? Because the referendum can either pass and in this case, it failed. End of story. So, which means we have the constitution as amended in 2016, plus the Bill of Rights that has been there from 1991. Mm -hmm. It is the way it is. That is the choice of the people. That is what we must respect. Now, you don't. Well, there is talk, as a song of Yes. But. Uh, you know, we are laymen, but they tell us that there are many lacunas, there are many inconsistencies in the constitutions, the current constitution, there are many inadequacies. The very argument, I think, that fostered Bill 10, mm. and the very reason that drove the amendments of Bill 10, mm. was that the, the constitution was not inclusive, and it had many lacunas, and it was contradicting itself. How do you respond to this as well as for a new constitution? It's a crazy idea. These were fictions conceived by the PF, okay, as a prelude to build two. Okay? But, you know, even when they say, first of all, there's no word called lacunas. Okay? Educators. Yes, there's no word called lacunas. Okay, lacuna is singular. Plural is lacunae. Okay. An e at the an e, yeah. an s. So it's a Latin word. Yes. Mm. So what is a lacuna? Lacuna is a gap. Now you have looked at that instrument. Do you see gaps there? Mm. There are no gaps. The articles run in sequence. When you are talking about the lacuna, you are basically saying, listen, maybe the article jumps from article ten, it goes to twelve. Mm. Yeah, so, but where is Article 11 here? It doesn't make sense. Mm. Then you say there is a gap because Article 11 is missing. Those are gaps. That's what is meant by lacuna. Now, there is no such a thing as gaps. These are provisions, for example, people which don't like. You begin to attack them. But the Constitution is not there to please people. There are certain provisions I may not like. There are certain provisions we don't, you, you may not like. That is the essence of rule of law. You have to accept the law as it is, not as you think it ought to be. 
A moment you begin to think about the law as it ought to be, that is a recipe of lawlessness. Well, it's a matter where politicians from both aisles, I think for their selfish um, uh, interests, appear to agree. For example, uh, the limitation process, mm -hmm. that we more need more delimitation process, more members of parliament. Uh, this falls in what they are calling non-contentious issues. Do you think there are non-contentious issues that need amendment parliament? Ambassador, when you say non-contentious, where are you coming from? Yeah. There has to be a reference point. Okay. From what, what perspective? What makes it contentious or not non-contentious? Such a thing as non-contentious process. Based on who? Huh? What is your reference point? You have to have a reference point on the basis of which you conclude this is non-contentious and this is contentious. Decides that. Okay. It's a crazy ideas that you hear about, and you just wonder, wh wh what kind of education do these people get? You take the law as it is. Now, going back to the issue of what you're talking about, Kunai or whatever, there is a point. The, the drafters of the Constitution recognize the fact that no Constitution is ever perfect yeah. because it is drafted by human beings, right? Then what do they do? we have created a special court, which is the constitutional court. We have a problem, you and I have a dispute. What do we do? We go to this court. If we think something doesn't make sense, it is not for you as a politician to make that determination. You go to court, and the court will have to agree with you whether there is, there is a, a conflict or not. Through the process of precaution, the court will harmonize those provisions. And what the court, the court will guide us. That is why we have a constitutional court. And that is why those judges, ideally, the, the rationale is that they should have serious training in matters of the constitution. That's a different matter. Yeah. Uh, that is now a manpower problem. Mm. But there are mechanisms within the constitution for it to address its own inadequacies. Okay, for example, so the so called lacunas, inadequacies, and provision that are not speaking to one another can be resolved in your view by the constitutional court. Right. Here we are, we can read the same provision, you can disagree with you, and you can disagree with me. Okay, but, uh, but uh, do, do I have then the right to tell you this is wrong? If that right. The moment I assume that right, it is lawlessness because the constitution says. This constitution is binding on each and every one of us. Okay? I have no right to say, I agree with this or I disagree. No. Whether I like it or not, it is the law and I'm bound by what the constitution says. This brings me to another issue. There was this heated debate over Bill 10. Yes. You opposed it. Yes. And many opposed it. The UPND also opposed the yes. amendments of the constitution. Yes. But as soon as they came to power, they said, no, 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 we may need to amend the constitution. In fact, you know, from the debate, they appear that they may lift the same uh, clause or some of the clauses from the 10 as proposals to amend the constitution. You may have opposed the 10, I think for different reasons than other stakeholders. Because for you, I think you are saying, let's test the constitutions. If there are gaps, let's go to the constitutional court. I don't think that uh, the process should be through amendments or through a new constitution. You know, that's the indecency of politicians. Okay? There is need for consistency. Okay? If for some reason they believe that certain provisions were, were problematic, why didn't they say so during the time of Bill 10? They didn't. Okay? And the entire Bill 10 collapsed thanks to UPND members who did not support it. Therefore, they couldn't get the two-thirds majority required. Now, how can, after you have opposed the bill, in one instance, three years later, you want to come back as actually there is a priority, different priority. How can it be a priority? This is the indecency of the politicians that we talk. There has to be consistency. I have maintained my position. This constitution that we have as amended in 2016 is the best instrument we have ever had in the history of this country. It wow. is not perfect, but it is the best. Far better. It is far better than where we have come from. If civil society, the Oasis Forum, 
if they have money from donors to, to, to spend, that money should be spent on civic education. What's up? My name is Ken Dumbo, the MC with the sauce. Don't forget to subscribe to JQ. Of the Constitution. Of the Constitution. Mm. They should undertake an exercise to educate people on the Constitution and what it provides. Because I can bet you, I don't think I do any of those cabinet ministers even understand what the Constitution provides. And this is the problem we have. I don't think I do any of the members of parliament have ever, ever, even ever read the Constitution. This is the instrument they swear to defend and protect. Mm. They take oath. Now, they take oath. What, what are some of the good provisions in these 2016 elections? Because maybe we're just speaking on what we see my bad ones. What do you think? Where have we made progress? We have made significant progress. First of all, I've just talked about uh, Article 5, right? Yeah. Which now says power that is not vested in a specific individual rests with the people. That, that has never been there in the previous constitution. Okay? Those are the issues we should be able to embrace. There's for other provisions. For instance, I'll tell you, uh, there is, um, uh, as part of civic education, yeah. what we should be talking about is to actualize some provisions of the constitution. For example, uh, one of the benefits that uh, exists now, right, which has helped PF remain intact is in the constitution. Explain. Well, there's a provision in the constitution which says that if you resign as a member of parliament, as a member of parliament you will not be allowed to contest. Okay? You have to wait until the next cycle. Ah, so the opportunity can be that may reach to cross to UPMD. Yes. And they must, if they cross the floor or resign, they may not be eligible until after five months. They are not eligible. They are not. They are not. You can't force a by election. And then at the end of the, you cross the floor. The and, receipt, you participate. and you participate. No, you won't, you won't qualify to participate. That's why PF has remained intact. There is no incentive to cross over. Because first of all, you're going to cross over. Yes. <laughs> I've already chewed your graduate in advance. Yeah, yeah. Now you want to cross over. Mm. Unless you previously the crossing over was okay because you could cross over and you still stand and return. Like for example, you can cross over to if you are PF, you can cross over to UPND and UPND can adopt you. Mm. You recontest your seat and run. Yeah. That provision is no longer there. You resign, that's it, you are done. You, can't, you don't close, close the by election. Yes, you can't. You can't take that. Mm -hmm. But there is no incentive for people to cross mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. That's why, for up to this day, EF has remained intact. Largely due to that, due to that provision. Yeah. That yeah. is progress. That is consolidating your democracy. Oh, you are right. We may get many things for granted. For example, the election date was not previously prescribed. Exactly. exactly. Now it is prescribed. Now it is. Pro oh, that may, takes me to another point. Uh, I've heard people say uh, we can go for an early election. Oh, no, that's a big thing. <laughs> that's a big thing because <laughs> before you come in, let me explain. I've just not got for early election. So I want to use the opportunity to educate me to those being a uh, thought. Yes. Looking at the three years of President Laka in the HLM, looking at his economic policies and the state of the country. Yeah. Clearly, he has sunk us in a hole that he cannot get us out. True. There is a comparison to 1990, where they had failed. They had tried all the tricks from the books, and they had failed. Yes. So that Indochina is being compared to this, and looking at the state of the country, is, is proposed solutions. People don't see the proverbial light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. so they've called for early election. Mm -hmm. Saying it's not possible from the provision of the constitution. Exactly. If I to try to educate me and educate my my audience, it can't happen. Okay? It can't happen. It's impossible. Whether you like HH or you don't, you are stuck with him for the next day, for the remainder of his term. Until 2016. Until 2016. Uh, until 2026. We are stuck with that. Okay? 
Why? Because the Constitution now, what is interesting, and people don't respect this document. Every, most of the clauses in the Constitution have historical background. When President Mwanawasa was in office, there was an amendment to the Electoral Act. What used to happen is that although the provision, the Constitution say you'll have general election every five years, the date of election was invariably set by the president. So the president of the ruling party would make all the arrangements in advance. In advance. And then set the, the and surprise the opposition. That provision has now been taken away. The constitution says every five years, in, on a Thursday of, uh, should be, I think, August, uh, second Thursday of August, five, every five years, there should be a general election. It's no longer a preserve of the president to state the election then. He is set by the constitution. So, for example, we can even check the calendar right now and identify the day Zambo go to election 2026. Even in 2031, even 100 years later, we can tell which exact date of the week we are going to have elections. So the power has been taken away. Now, I've had all these things. I mean, I've had people come to ask me, say, what happens if he, all the all, all the the first members of parliament resign from uh, parliament. What, what happens? Will there be an end election? No, there won't be an end election. They resign, they quit. There'll be by elections. Mm. Okay, mm. there'll be by elections, which you probably may even win. And what happens? You bury PF. You cannot have an early election. Okay. So, if President Daka in the wants to this pressure where he can see that you resolve the economic crisis of our country and other crises of our country. And so to resign I call for any election. What does the constitution say? He can't. It would be an illegal move. Mm. He doesn't have power to do that. If he, if he says he has failed, right, he resigns and the vice president takes over for the remainder of the time. Well, that's why the vice president is running with. He's elected by the people. Exactly. And I don't that there's vacancy in the presidents by death, resignation, incapacity, or any other. The vice president takes over. In 2026, you don't have an early election. Mm. Okay? The only instance when the president can cause, you can go for an early election, it is where the president, when this is in Article 81, by the way, yeah. where he can show that uh, Parliament is not able to play ball with him. For example, if he is not able to pass legislation, for instance, if that would happen, for instance, if at all the National Assembly is controlled by the opposition, or say, hang Parliament, yes, so that they make it difficult for him to govern. In that situation, he can also the dissolution of the National Assembly and go for an early election. But that measure is subject to, it has to be taken to the constitutional court. It's not a matter of determination. determination. Is it true that indeed you cannot govern? Is it true that the National Assembly has made your life difficult as president? It is up to the constitutional court to confirm whether indeed that is the position. If that is the position, they are clear with the president, then the National Assembly is dissolved, we go for any election. Okay. Wow. I think you, you have educated both us and the UPND. If the UPND had that thought, they would have shut us up and would have said, what you're proposing is not even within the law. Right. This part, I am saying, forget about the roadmap, forget about the amendment, educate yourself on the Constitution. This is the problem we have. For example, you have a president who wakes up and says, oh, he employed those nurses who, who, who assisted at Independence Stadium. He says, but how? That's not the job of the president. It's not. It may be popular, but it may not be legal. Because that's not the response. That's not how government works, Ambassador. You have worked in government. Yes. You don't just employ people anyhow. Okay, now, and the president can't just formulate policies as he's walking, he makes a pronouncement, boom, it becomes policy. No, 
This formulation is the responsibility of cabinet. What's up? My name is Ken Dumbo, the MC with the sauce. Don't forget to subscribe to Jayku. Okay. Yeah. This is the extent of lawlessness we are in. That's why we have so many problems. We don't follow the law. We don't respect the law. Everything is laid down. Okay. For example, Ambassador, uh, we have a problem to do with the relationship between uh, central government and local government. Now, first of all, central government doesn't respect the function of local authorities. Don't. And that is why you have so many problems. Now, for instance, and even when you look at all of these things, I don't think I would even understand that the power to govern district is exclusively vested in the district councils and municipal councils. If they know, they don't respect it. Yeah. Okay? The job of the central government is to ensure that local authorities are adequately funded. Because every, I mean, even the, the idea where you have... Uh, is it the CDF vehicles? Yeah. And police vehicles, both bought by Ministry of Local Government on behalf of How? local authorities. How? The funding is withheld yeah. and the determination is made that you need a police vehicle. You need uh, an ambulance. Now you need uh, uh, business ambassador. You, you need uh, a, a monitoring and evaluation vehicle. How? The needs of local authorities are different. Okay? They're different. The responsibility of local of the central government is to give money to these local authorities, decide themselves what their own budgets and what priorities are. Okay, some will tell you we don't need a vehicle. Okay, our biggest priority may be this or maybe that or sort out the water system. For example, something very basic: licensing of motor vehicles. You know that's the responsibility of local authorities. Oh yes. Based on the constitution, that's what they're doing there. Shouldn't be there. These are things that should be changed to harmonize with the constitution. Mm. Vehicle licensing is a responsibility of local authorities as a mechanism for local revenue. Local revenue, and they understand the dynamics better. Mm. Okay, mm. so that if you are a district, you have more vehicles, it means more damage to your roads, and for that reason, you should be able to collect more revenue from vehicle licensing. Vehicle licensing should not go to the central government or should not even go to the emergency. That is supposed to be the, the money is also funding for the for the local authority. We have the right to these things. Wow. Okay? There are many things in the constitution which people have not read, just like I was explaining about this notion that you can have an early election in Zambia. You can't mm -hmm. have an early election. That is what, if I thought there is a relaunch of the Oasis Forum, what they should do is to carry out civic education. Yeah. For example, there is another provision in the constitution, for example. We have been talking about poverty in, this, in these areas. Yeah. Let's take Northwestern province. All these areas where these mines, big mines are operating, those areas are owned by chiefs. Okay? Now, how much of the revenue being generated from these mines actually going to the local people? And yet, the Constitution addresses that. Okay? In Article 168, the government is supposed to pass legislation which will provide for how the, the utilization of the resources in these areas is supposed to be managed. If I may just read it, it yes, says, the role of a chief in the management control sharing of natural and other resources in the chief form shall be prescribed. Wow. There's supposed to be a profit sharing mechanism of the resources that are being harvested from these local areas, exactly. from these traditional exactly. countries. It should be best. It is what the Oasis for should be advocating for to say, can we make sure that these chiefs, where resources, wealth is being generated from their chiefdoms, there is a mechanism for them to benefit. And that is why you see what's being generated. But these people still remain poor. Yeah. Okay? Now, so, there are many provisions in the Constitution. 
Such a law has never been passed. That's what we should be for. We have prescribed in the subsidiary to provide for such a mechanism. Mm. And if there is, we should be able to see how it is implemented. Mm. Now, these uh, investors, you know what they can do? They can close up today, pack up and go. Because your investment policy says uh, you employ people and pay their taxes yes. and pay as you in, and that's your duty. Yeah. The duty of development is up to up to you know your government. We will pay tax and your government must bring development. Yes. That is why you see some of the richest uh, uh, in our country are payment poor. Yes. Because the, the investor says, look, I pay taxes to a central government. Yeah. And I was not personally aware that there's no provision for mechanisms for sharing of that resources. Why should, for example, I'll, I'll give you an example. I grew up in Muflira. Yeah. Now, they will tell you that Muflira produces the best copper in the world, yeah. which fetches a premium. Now, you go to Muflira today, Muflira looks like a war zone. Yeah. There has never been any serious investment in Muflira since 1964. But Palafo Center. Yes. Exactly. Mm. But the point is that this is the world where the wealth is being generated. Now, money, we should be talking about, and even all those MPs and councillors, those are the issues we should be talking about. How do we make sure that wealth that is generated for the areas, actually, we benefits the people? Now, even your local authorities, instead of sharing blocks and so forth, those are the issues they should be talking about. How do we make sure if a district doesn't have well, uh, natural resources, it's different, it becomes a, cont a contradiction and immoral for a district to have so much wealth and yet remain so poor. Okay? That is completely unacceptable. But the Constitution addresses that. These are the issues we should be thinking about. How do we actualize this? Another provision that we're talking about, for example, uh, there's a requirement in the constitution to provide for, to regulate political parties mm. and regulate the funding of political parties. Article 16. Yes. Never has ever been passed. Mm. Okay. As a result, I mentioned, although we celebrate it to say it's a, it's a democratic election, no, it's actually, it's, it's, it's like uh, a, a fight between people with money. And this money comes from outside the country. Mm -hmm. And that distorts the quality of our democracy. There should be legislation to regulate how much money you put in in an, in an election. And from where? You have to disclose that. Okay? Your uh, UPF did not pass such legislation. And if UPND is truly committed to constitutional rule, that should be the law to pass. And if uh, Oasis Forum have time and money to campaign for anything, those are the measures they should be advocating for, not uh, uh, coming up with a full of the club and, and, and so forth. No, we don't need a home map. First of all, Ambassador, why would you change a constitution which you don't even understand in the first place? Yeah, true. Well, from what you okay. explained, like your consistent argument, you've said, let's test this constitution. Yes. Let it run its face. In other states, I think, which has been in existence over 200 years, has fewer than, I think, 10 amendments. Yes. We have more frequent amendments in the last 60 years than, uh, you know, many constitutions. As Ambassador have been going far, Botswana has had the same constitution since 1966. Wow. Okay. Of course, it has been amended here and there, but they have never thrown anything out you have amended it. If you look at Botswana, it's a far more prosperous Zambia, the country than Zambia, and it's even better governed than Zambia. Mm. And we had similar constitutions. Okay? So you cannot rush into attacking a document before you attack it. Do you understand it first? Mm. You must first understand it. You now come up with this fiction, lacuna, lacuna. There is no lacuna. You have an issue, go to the constitutional court. You know, and we have to avoid this situation where it has become a tradition. If the government that comes in, oh, we have to initiate a constitutional making process. Crazy. And it's completely irresponsible to do that. Mm -hmm. It is even worse when such an idea is being propagated by civil society. 
Mm. It is completely irresponsible. Yes. Civil society should be able to defend the constitution as it is to hold government accountable. Okay, so the, the, these ideas of trying to come up with a new, it's completely irresponsible and crazy. And in any case, it's not, even if we had, even if we wanted to, it's not a priority. Uh, I see. I see. Priority is so to survive. Mm. After all, you have already declared what they what, what, state of emergency. Yes. Mm. We are now expecting people to help you feed your people. What's up? My name is Ken Dumbo, the MC with the sauce. Don't forget to subscribe to Jeku. We're talking about the possibility of millions of people starving. About six million. Yes. Now you want to talk about a roadmap to a constitu for, for constitutional making? Mm. Clearly, you're not serious. Mm. Okay? Mm. So attention should be, how do we survive this drought mm. with minimal impact, with as few people as possible being exposed to starvation? That should be the conversation in the country. Mm. The roadmap, roadmap for a new constitution making. Responsible. And take a reprimand. The issues that they raised, the issues of governance and the issues of the rule of law. I think it's now established that there are concerns around the democratic space, that the democratic space is really shrinking and shrinking quickly. We have an inspector general of police that literally has suspended civil and political rights position. They've never had um, public meetings and public processions from 2021. The other things the inspector general of police is doing, for example, he says the members of the police that were hired during the period of 10 years under the patriotic front, he says he has begun the page to remove them. But they're junkies. He calls them junkies. His own police officers. Oh, that man drives him to his house. He says uh, they're a set of junkies. But there are other concerns. Yes. Uh, in, in the, the state of the rule of law, where from the president down to the lower organs, where they are, they don't appear to respect the rule of law. It appears to be the rule of man. Mm -hmm. What do you say to those issues? Before we transition to the other topic, I thought you could... It's a, it's a problem. But you see, and this is at least, it's a reminder to the voters. Okay, be careful you vote for. That's what it amounts to. Okay, first of all, uh, you, know, you, you need to look at... Um, uh, Again, we get so excited during the election time. We look at how a person has lived his life. Has he been one who has respected the law or not? Now, once he has, if he has a history of not respecting the law, you give him power, you become worse. If he's been a dealer all his life, you give him power. Well, once he assumes the presidency or he becomes a member of parliament or a councillor, you will do more deals. Okay. These are things that we have to watch out for. Now, uh, if somebody has always been a criminal, you give him power. You even commit more crimes. If somebody has been a good person all his life, you give him power, even becomes a better human being in the process. And you do good, not because the law says he should do good, but because it's in his nature. You know, the point is that, yes, there is a problem. You have an inspector general of police, first of all, they have misapplied the Public Order Act. The Public Order Act has been misapplied. You do not need permission to hold a public rally, to have a public uh, gathering. You don't. Your job is simply to inform the police. It's the only legal requirement. Okay? Now, before that, before the repeal, the case of Christine Mulundika case, you required a license, a permit to hold uh, a public gathering. The Supreme Court struck that down to say you do not need that. What you need to do in order to maintain law and order is to inform the police. And the contradiction, why is that? You simply inform them so that they can make adequate arrangements even that there is breakdown of law and order. Okay? Here is the stupidity of it all. You have no people to deploy to secure law and order, but you have enough policemen to go and chase those that wish to gather. I mean, how crazy can that be? 
That is lawlessness. We, we've allowed the police then to behave as, as if the Public Order Act is is as it was in 1998 before the amendment. Yes, and this is as I say, we've refused you. I mean, to have refused you notice. Can you refuse a notice? A notice. It's simply a notice. I'm informing you. This is what I intend to do. And the most logical thing, if they were working genuinely, and you know, what they could so, do is that, okay, can we ensure that ABCD is put in place? You can go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or when well, it provides for marshals. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, okay, fine. Go ahead. But what we'll do is that we'll give, we can only spare you 10 police officers. Can you make sure that you look for other people that can work together with the police officers to ensure there's no breakdown of law and order? Okay? Because I don't think at all the people who want to have rallies, they want to, to cause anarchy. No. Okay? It's just to ensure that there is order in the way the, the, the rallies are conducted. But also, the way these people uh, apply the law is as though it is based on the assumption Free rally will result in violence. There is no data to support that. Okay? So, but the sad part is that even if you look at the UPND manifesto, they clearly stated, we will make sure the Public Order Act is properly enforced. Correctly uh -huh. enforced. It's in their own manifesto. manifesto. It should take time to read it. Mm -hmm. They recognized that the Public Order Act was being misapplied. It was being abused. It was being abused by PF. And they promised that they'll be able to, uh, the, the fact they are, their commitment is that it's actually to repeal it. But before they repeal, they said, we'll make sure that it is applies as it should be. What we are now seeing is even worse form of application, misapplication, than what was under the PF. Okay. Yes, so there is another matter of concern to me and to many the people advocates of freedom of expression and freedom of the press like you. The arrests. First, our celebration that uh, the president had repealed the defamation of the president to our celebrations. Before that, there were numerous arrests of people arrested, so called insulting the president. Sadly, under the Cybersecurity and Cybercrimes Act of 2021, Provisions that uh, were in criminal defamation of the president are literally just were literally exported and other offenses against speech. They are raised against people who are speaking against government, issuing TikTok videos or just Facebook videos or going live. Rather than as politicians, there are many ordinary people that are being arrested under those without laws. What do you say to this? It goes down to, you know, and it comes back to the Constitution. The Constitution guarantees freedom of expression, okay? Now, there are those, the law may say one thing. The problem is misapplication of the law, okay? Yes, we're not saying that uh, everybody that is on these uh, platforms use them correctly. There will always be people that will abuse that. And then in the process, you, you need the law to enforce that. But the problem is the extent to which the law is being abused. Now, it will take you maybe three or four years to go through that trial. And you're not even sure because of who you are. You get convicted because really you committed a crime. Because first of all, the judiciary, the magistrates are already intimidated anyway. Okay? That's the problem. Even if you get acquitted, just that inconvenience for the number of year, months or years that you'll have to be shuttling between your place and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, and the courts. You were telling me about how you had to wait for a magistrate for, since from morning up to... No, to, to at the end of the 17 hours. Up to 17 hours. How do you have a court operating like that? You call for people to report 9 o'clock. You don't sit as a magistrate until 17 hours. Where, where, I mean, how? Even as fellow human beings, how do you treat other people like that? Do you keep another human being waiting from nine o'clock up to 17 hours? It's just inhumane. We're just terrible human beings, okay? Our biggest problem is how we abuse power. 
our mentality should be to say, let me treat other people the way I would like to be treated if I thought I was on the other side of the fence. Okay. Always perceive yourself that today or tomorrow you also break the law. How would you like to be treated? Okay. But this is more of a moral issue, mm -hmm. not so much of a, mm -hmm. of a, of a legal issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let, let's migrate to another important issue in this country. The family silver, the mines. What's up? My name is Ken Dumbo, the MC with the sauce. Don't forget to subscribe to JQ. Uh, the developments in, um, for CM was put under liquidation in 2018 because of the huge debt that previous investor Vedanta had accumulated. Mapani, Blanco decided on his own, I think, because of uh, the issues we were facing in London and um, in the US spots where they were being pursued for both um, tax evasion, um, corruption, and bribery, and other issues. They decided to decamp from their assets in, in Zambia, in Namibia, South Africa, and Australia. And they hammered a deal where the Zambian government were to take over absolute ownership through the CMIH and pay through a debt of, you know, with, with room of $1.5 billion. So when President Akainde Chilema comes into power, the major assets in this country, other than the ones owned by, you know, Barry Gold and First Quantum in Northwestern Province, the major mining assets are in the hands of government. The decision to sell or give back to Vedanta, I think was a contentious one, you saw the debate. Recently, Mopani was sold to a new investor from Dubai. Let me just give a brief background before I invite your comment. On, on, on KCM, President Dagan Nechilema says we are not going to mine in courts. So he dropped the, the court cases. Similarly, under First Quantum, under Kansanshi, there were similar issues. So they dropped all those court cases and uh, invited the investors to take full control. On KCM, the issues of Vedanta, its viability, its standing currently internationally, and also its record of 20 years when it was here. On the panel, an open process started. The Ministry of Mines announced through ZCMIH that uh, they will hire a professional consultant, an international company, Rothschild, was hired, and another legal company, another law firm, I think, is it Case and something, were hired deal with the sale of Mupani. Although many Zambians didn't agree that we should sell at all, but the decision was made by government. They advertised. They listed by May 2023 10 bidders who had expressed interest. By July, government announced that they had whittled down the list to four prospecting investors that had shown interest. By October, they said we are final. We are on the last lap. In January, and the four bidders were announced, by the way, there were two Chinese firms, a South African firm, and a group by former Glencoe professionals and miners who had formed a vehicle of their own. But in January, we were surprised. President Nakainda Ichilema and the Minister of Mines announced that they had a new interested party in Mopani. Uh, and they introduced this company from Dubai, International Resource Holdings. They claimed that it was a company that was affiliated, a subsidiary of a bigger company that all of us know, mm. International Holdings Company. Mm. It's a well-reputed, well-known company. But the link between it and this International Resource Holdings is not really seen or known. Mm. And within, within a few weeks, we saw the CMIH apply to uh, the stock, Osaka Stock Exchange that they had they this deal they were dealing with, they found extraordinary AGM, which approved the deal, sale of 51% shares of this international resource holdings. The other details are that this investor pledged to invest $1.1 billion. He says he will use, out of that $1.1 billion, he will use $400 million to liquidate the debt of Blanco, which was 1.5, it had come down to around six hundred million dollars, and they, they say they got a discount. The remainder of the six hundred million dollars, the, the investors said it has to go to 
investment in the mines to ramp up production. I'm bringing out all this background for your answer on two issues. The stakeholders, the opposition and civil society have said, looking at the history of our country and state-owned uh, enterprises, where we had 325 companies and someone just sold them like that under a whiff of privatization. These remaining assets, the, 20, the 33 assets, will require that you go to parliament and get a two-thirds majority, all that is provided for under Article 210. Number two, the other matter of concern is that the investor for the transfer of these shares, the 51%, there's no money coming in the treasury. So the investor is saying, give me 51% shares, at least $620 million for the 51% shareholding. It's not coming to you. It is going to the mines. So people are saying, then what have we done? What have mm. we sold? Mm. Because when we sell or transfer shares, mm. I should get something in the kitty. Mm. Bring fresh investment mm. to invest in the mines. Mm. So those are the two current debates, especially on Mopani. Mm. We then need to go to parliament in accordance with Article 210, okay. Sabbatical 2. And then the other issues, I leave the board to you. That's fine. Um, there are two things, right? Um, the three uh, events prior to Delta taking over majority interest in uh, in uh, Mopani uh, is something I cannot comment on because I've not looked at the documentation, okay? And sometimes it's not good to rely on unverified information. I prefer to look at information myself and make my own judgment. But I'll say about Mopani, I'll say it in two forms. On paper, as it stands, it is a fantastic deal. That's one thing that we have to acknowledge. It is a very, very good deal better than KCM, better than possibly any other deal that has been struck. That's one aspect. But unfortunately, that transaction is illegal. It's unconstitutional. Now, you raise the important issues about how this funding has to be managed and everything else. And I remember my sister, Nawakwi, was saying that... Uh, the, the revenue from uh, the sale of the share should have gone to control 99 and, and, uh, and so forth. The point is this, and she was trying to run parallels between the previous private privatization program of the 90s. Of the 90s and this one. This is completely different. There are no parallels there, okay? Because what has happened then, all these assets were owned by directly government or ZCCM. So they were sold as assets, okay? So therefore, it was government selling and receiving the money. What you have now, all these assets, uh, if we take Mopani, for example, it was sold initially to, uh, to Glenco. Glenco, right? Then Glenco sold it back to government, okay? Government has now sold it back to uh, Delta. Now, these are different kind of transactions. Okay, so the treatment and how the revenue is treated is completely different. Let me just explain on one thing. If the deal goes through and it is implemented, as set out on the paper, on paper, uh, yes, it will revitalize Mopani, okay, which will be good for the country. And also it is about making sure the implication is that by virtue of holding 49% of the shares, it will also mean that government will be able to, government, of course, through all these other, through ZCCMHI, IDC, and ultimately, will be able to get whatever a profit is made, 49% of that profit will have to go to government, theoretically. But there are a number of factors to take into account. First of all, let me explain about how the shareholder, uh, 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 it was so painful to watch the Minister of uh, Mines to explain exactly what does. Uh, well, the Minister of Mines yes. sparked, um, in fact, international debate 
who insisted that there was no sale of Bukani, okay. yeah. and he said the transfer of shares. Mm. I'm trying to circumvent yes. that you've called an illegality. Article 210, uh. Sabbatical 2. He says, no, 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 no. It was just transfer of shares. Whatever, uh, happened, yeah. whatever happened, the outcome is uh, what is the end result? Okay, so the end result, whichever way you look at it, it results in an illegality. Okay. Now, yes, it is a fantastic deal, but that does not authorize you to override the constitution. It still remains illegal, even if it is, it is a very sweet deal, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. But it's true. And in any case, somebody was saying, but who is responsible? The parties to the transaction are all responsible to comply with the constitution, including Delta itself. When you come to do business in any country, you are obliged to respect the laws of that country, including the constitution of that particular country. And Article 1 is very clear. Any act or omission that is inconsistent with the constitution is null and void. Yeah. It's as simple as that. What makes it illegal? Uh, let's go back to unbundle it. Uh, first of all, what has uh, transpired? We must first of all acknowledge, if we wind it back, when Glencoe was moving out, uh, there was already a debt of well in excess of $4 billion in the form of shareholder loans into Mopani. This was a huge burden. Then PF government negotiated that to $1.5 billion and they provided for a mechanism for the repayment of that. Which would that's, that's very, very important. Yes. Although the make business sense. No. But just invested, I think, in two new shafts. Yes. And that's a multi billion dollar investment. That's right. Just invested in a small town, I think, some form of refinery. Yes. So I think that's where you are talking about shareholder loans of up to $4 billion. $4 billion. So it's a well invested asset. It is. It is. So I think background information is always good. But unfortunately, we elected people <laughs> who, who cannot even know, uh, provide, the, uh, who cannot uh, digest these things and explain it to the people. So, okay, you have liability of $4 billion. It is reduced to $1.4 billion. Yeah. $1.5 is an attractive deal. And then they provided uh, for repayment in the form of Whatever. Market rights. Yeah, in terms of copper, that was free yes, to me. Yes. They took over the market rights. That's and right. They determined how much they could give you back. That's so they, they, they could provide as, as you liquidate. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, but the problem is they left Mopani broke. They only left, by based on the sources that I've been able to establish, they only left $200,000 to undermine when they were exiting. Now, how do you run a mine with $200,000? Okay. But I understand the management that remained there tried to gobble together some money to keep it running and so forth. But unfortunately, mining is an expensive venture. Okay. So what happened is that from the time they took off, government took over, Mopani has been operating at a loss. Okay. Because it didn't. So happen. from 2020 yes, to then. It's been operating at a loss. And the loss has a reason from the fact that they have had no working capital. Mm. As a result, the debts have been going up, up. So what Mopani needed was cash injection in terms of working capital. So they now find I'm not privy to all those people that who did the bidding, but I'm just mm -hmm. confining myself to the, to the, to, you have. Yeah, to the mm -hmm. Delta deal. What is the structure of the Delta deal? The structure of the Delta deal is a good deal in the sense that uh, as part of these negotiations, although the minister claimed that they paid off uh, Glencoe, that's not true. Mm. Okay, that's not correct. They didn't pay yeah. off Glencoe and that money didn't come from uh, government. Out of the $1.4 billion uh, that was agreed upon, they were able to negotiate with Glencoe to bring their debt down from 1.4, because I think there was an attempt to service that loan, yeah. but yeah. I think they didn't make much dent into it. So they negotiated that debt from uh, 1.4 to about $400 uh, million. 
Okay, so already on the books of uh, Mopani, that date has shrunk. So oh, what they have now done is that, by the way, for that 1.4, 1.5 billion dollar debt, all the assets of Mopani were mortgaged to Glencoe. Mm -hmm. Until the debt is clear. Until the debt is clear. But with the new deal now, that debt of Glencoe of 1.4 has been extinguished. Instead, Mopani now has a debt. Delta as a shareholder. So what has happened? Delta stepped in the shoes of Glencoe, mm -hmm. having paid Glencoe 400 million. So they negotiated that. So the assets of uh, Mopani, all the assets actually mortgaged to Delta. Wow. Okay. Wow. By the way, you can actually, I mean, again, we don't uh, read. Mm -hmm. This information is available at Bakra, by the way. Oh. Okay. Let's tell us. Yes. Based on the printout from Parkra, it clearly shows, uh, for example, that right now, if you look at, there's an entry, which is, uh, which reads 1st October, 1st uh, April, yeah, yeah. 2020, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, yeah, which, no, 1st April, 2021, there is this bit of 1.4 billion. Mm -hmm. For Blanco. Now, if you check the Bakra record, it now says fully paid. Wow. When you now have Delta now, which have now registered their own mortgage, which was registered on 20th of March 2024, it is talking about almost 400 million, which is unpaid. Mm. That is one. That three, 400 million has come from that 1.4. Mm -hmm. So it's a good deal in the sense that you have extinguished a $1.4 billion debt to a $400 million. But unfortunately, that means we've just transferred the asset from Blanco now but yes. to Delta. They have not, all the assets now belong to, they are now mortgaged to Delta. But so for Mopani, the liability has come down to $400 million. Mm. By the way, Delta has already paid Blanco mm. in full. Now, there is an interesting point. The question is, how can somebody accept to take a knock of uh, almost 1.1 billion? 1.1 billion. There is an agreement now involving Mopani and Glencoe and the other parties, where there is a commit, there is a royalty payment to be paid up to 2036. That is, in the event that the copper between now and 2036 is sold for. Twelve thousand dollars and above, and above, they'll get a royalty of ten percent. My God! Okay, so there's no discount. The no. Glenco will appear for them up to twenty thirty six. Twenty thirty six. So in a month, if you sell, so so if you sell your copper, uh, because right now it's at about what eight thousand or whatever. Yeah. So I don't know what uh, I don't know what projection they have utilized. I have no idea. They expect that. It will reach twelve thousand dollars a ton, and if it reaches that markup, there's a trigger. They'll get ten percent royalty. The the you know the fixes of views to government giving away both KCM and Mopan, whatever the challenges, is that projection shows that the price of copper mm -hmm. is just going to rise and rise. Mm -hmm. It's at nine thousand dollars already. Mm -hmm. Just from three years ago, it jumped from somewhere around six thousand to nine thousand to ten thousand. Mm -hmm. 12,000, we are not far away from it. In fact, the, 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 the projections from what I read is that uh, prices will go as soon as, soon, as soon as possible to $20,000 per ton. It's possible. But so that means there is a price sharing mechanism with Glencoe. Glencoe, yes. 2036. To 2036. But the beauty is that you are looking at a dead mine, which is not mining anything. Okay? So you can have 100% of zero. And uh, but uh, nothing is happening in, mm. in Mopani. Now they are injecting. So the projection is that they expect that I don't know what the current output of Mopani is. It is expected that in the next two years, three years, they're able to ramp up production of Mopani to about two hundred thousand, two hundred thousand metric ton per, per, per annum, which should be quite a significant revenue. On the on the remainder of the money 
what has happened is that out of that 620 uh, million, now there is also some other liability in between involving some third party creditors who I think they have paid out about 180 million. There is that liability. But what is the real money that has been injected into, that will be injected into Mopani? That will be $620 million. Now, out of that, well, like you have rightly put it, Mopani did a lot of investment in terms of developing mining areas and for development. Now, what they did was these things were stopped halfway. Some of them were 80% complete, 70% complete. They have done the projections, which shows that it will take about $400 million to finish those projects and increase the production. So there is that $400 million, which will now be invested, but that $400 million will not be readily available. What's up? My name is Ken Dumbo, the MC with the sauce. Don't forget to subscribe to Jeku. We'll be given out in tranches. Because you're talking about for mine development, you won't need it at once. But as and when it is required, money will be made available. Then there is two or 200, for $200 million, this is what is now required as working oh. capital. Mm. That is how the deal is structured. Now, the criticism that government coffers have received nothing. Yes. Now, here's the point. The question is, how and why was the deal structured this way? The issue is very simple. Who needs the money? The entity that needs money is Mopani. So Mupani had to find, because government doesn't have the money to inject Mopani. Government is broke. Okay? Correct. So Mopani had to find another way of raising that capital, for work, money required for working capital, and also to, uh, to complete the projects. So Mopani now had to raise that money. By selling its shares. That's right. So now, Let's go and let's backtrack a little bit. When uh, Glencoe walked away, government owned 100% of the shares of ZC, of uh, Mopani. Mopani. Yes, of course, through ZCCMH. I'll, I'll use ZCCMHI interchangeably with government because government is the ultimate beneficiary. It held 100% as a shareholder. Now, the point which is that government did not need money. Now, although it held that, uh, by the way, Mopani in total has 200 million shares, okay? Which uh, its a cap nominal capital is $200 million, uh, which comprises 200 million shares divided of whose value is $1 each. Okay. Now, what they do, out of that 200 million, uh, 6.9 million was issued to ZCCM, okay? The rest were not issued. So uh, ZCCM held 100% of the issued share capital of Mopani. Now, those... 9 million shares have remained with ZCCMHI. Now, if Delta was to buy from that 6.9, then the money would have gone to ZCCMHI. Okay? But ZCCMHI didn't need the money. The entity that needs the money is Mopani. Mopani. So therefore, for the 620 million, they said, okay, we want to have 51% of the shares of Mupani. We want to be the majority share. So technically, Delta owns Mupani. Now, how do we achieve that? Two ways. They could have sold, they could have bought shares directly from ZCCM, but that would not have solved the problem. So what do we do? Remember, ZCCM is the only shareholder in Mopani. So ZCCM makes a decision to say Mopani should issue shares which will be equal to 51% of the issued share capital of 
money. That is how Delta now ended up being, being given nearly 7.2 million shares. So, so ZCC has 6.9 million and uh, Delta has 7.2. This is how they structured it. Is it a sell or not? It is a sell. The only sell is between Delta and Mupani. Mm. In the sense that the money is going to Mupani because it is Mupani that needs the money. The technical word that we uh, that uh, we is used in 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 law is that Mopani allotted shares to Delta. Delta. It's to Excel because for six hundred and twenty million dollars, Delta has received seven point two million shares. Mm. It is Excel. Okay, although the minister was trying to say it's not a sell, he yeah, was trying to educate us with yeah. not a subscription means you don't know what to... money has changed hands. There's a contract. Shares of shares. Yes. I need the money, which is my consideration, which is uh, you need shares, I need the money. Consideration, there's an offer and acceptance. Yes, Basic a contract uh, principle. Uh, you have the shares. With consideration for me as Mopani. He shares the consideration from you as well cash. is cash. There's a transaction. Now, that is what the way it has been structured. Fantastic deal on paper. But it is important, before I move on to the legality of it, uh, it is important that the key players keep an eye on this transaction to make sure that the parties act as expected. Because we have had experiences in the past whereby an investor comes in Promises to bring in money in the bank and everything. But perhaps it's an example. Exactly. It has signed $1.5 billion investment in KCM for 20 years. Exactly. So, in this case, Mopani is in a healthier position than KCM, far mm -hmm. much better. Mm -hmm. So, we're talking about 400 million or so, and there is already, I understand, the 200 million, I think uh, part of it has already been displaced. By the way, it was actually displaced by a local bank, Zanaco, anyway, the initial amount, mm -hmm. of course, guaranteed by Delta. So, so did they bring in fresh money to your, from your information, or did they bring from the local markets? I remember, for example, the sale of um, Zanaco, um, you know, 51% shareholding, or was it 49? Where rubber bank from um, from uh, the Netherlands, because they mm. had money from in the bank to pay for a transaction like mm. this. Mm. So I hope yeah. that... Uh, I think mean, that's not one and the same. Mm. The point is that a large chunk of the money which has been initially released mm. came from Zanaco. Okay. Okay, so we don't know how they done it. It doesn't really matter Structure. how the money comes in. What is important is that money goes into Mupani. That is what is important. Oh, you know it's important. Yes. If such an opportunity was given to local people, Yes. Where, for example, a local bank lends to them what? on a mine. What? What? So we seem to open these doors to foreign entities who we respect more, and we can put an outlay of $400 million for them. That can never happen to a local person. So to some extent it is. Yeah, but well, I, I, I don't want to discuss yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. As to whether government should be running businesses in the first, first place. place, I don't yeah. think that the government should be running businesses. Mm. Because the history of our parastatos clearly shows that government should not be running businesses, okay? Mm -hmm. But anyway, coming back to the issue we're talking about, that is how it is structured. But ultimately, what is the effect? Mm -hmm. The effect is that we have transferred control or ownership of Mopani to Delta. Both okay. by shareholding and by assets, as you demonstrated. That, that's, what, that's what it means. So, now, let's remember, even before Glencoe went out, right? ZCCM held about 10% of the yes. shares, right? So it was basically a minority shareholder. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the person calling the shots was Lenko, mm -hmm. not uh, ZCCM. ZCCM. And even in this case, thank you, it is Delta calling the shots, not ZCCM HI, because they are 51%. Whether as long, the moment you be going into the mine, you lose 50%. Uh, fifty percent of the shares are handed over to another entity. You have lost control. Okay, so there is a transfer. In any case, all those people that are talking about whether it was a sale or what, the constitution talks also about a transfer. 
Please okay. come to the issue of the okay. constitution. So, how is this transaction? You've demonstrated it is sweet, it's needed, yes. it might revitalize uh, the copper belt, but yes. governance. Yes. The it is illegal in the sense that you see, when you look at Article 1, 120, uh, 1, 110, now, again, like many other provisions in the constitution, we have a background. Okay. Now, the issue of constitutionalizing the dispose of government assets started with the, with, the Monaco, with, with the Mungomba Constitution Commission. Now, by that time, we had already gone into, we, have, uh, we had 15, 15 years of privatization, and the results were horrendous in terms of how the entire process was, was done. So when it came up before the Constitution Commission, this issue was raised. Those that are interested can go and look at uh, page um, at pages seven hundred and twenty-one of the Mungomba Constitutional Commission report, which was released in June. What's up? My name is Ken Dumbo, the MC with the source. Don't forget to subscribe to Jku of twenty zero five. If you may indulge me, let me just read. Yes, I read what yes. it says. Uh, it says here. Um, the commission, this is the Constitution Commission, says, observes that the need for privatization gained momentum in the 1980s following the widespread disappointment with the general performance of state-owned enterprises. The commission notes that most developing countries which had enthusiastically embraced state-owned enterprises reported less than satisfactory experiences with them. State-owned companies failed to perform for a variety of reasons, including application of inappropriate technology, to dependence on processing of imported raw materials, inexperienced management, misappropriation of resources by officials appointed by governments to run them. I'm sure that disease should even be worse today yeah. now. Okay? These are the reasons why, when we are talking about uh, this Zambian experience and so forth, and operation in mono monopolistic environments was no competition. The implication of this was that state-owned enterprises were typically potentially inefficient. They affect, this affected their financial viability, which in turn required that government subsidizes their operations. Thus, many countries saw privatization as a cure for public sector deficits. The commission also observed that and as an economic policy, privatization is not unique to Zambia. As many developing countries struggling to activate their battered and declining economies have either voluntarily or been forced to turn to privatization, privatization as a key economic policy for bringing about uh, dynamic and sustainable. Uh, uh, let me jump here. Let's say, commission notes that. In Zambia, most of the privatized companies are sold cheaply mm -hmm. as the program was rushed and no accurate assessment of the values of these companies was undertaken. Much as it was well intended, privatization has had a negative social impact. Yeah. It has resulted in the sale of most state-owned companies to mainly foreign buyers who have been unwilling to take on board most of the former employees of the enterprises which were sold. This has led to entrenchment, redundancies, and consequently massive unemployment in the country. Then they give the figures yeah. about how the labor force shrunk. And then they come to the case. In the case of Zambia Consolidated Copper Mines, some of the new owners failed to sustain the mining operations and opted to abandon the mines. We were forced to leave, leading to serious disruptions and distortions in the economy. And this has continued. Yeah. Okay, we had the experience of Anglo, we just worked out. Right. Okay, and here we have uh, Glanco, which uh, pulled out. So, they now came, uh, some of the foreigners, foreign investors who purchased state owned enterprises were only interested in asset stripping. So we have a long history of these things. So these things don't just come from thin air. They are born out of history. And this is what the commission said. In the light of the above consideration, the commission agrees that government should seek the approval of parliament, okay, before the sale, transfer, or disposal 
as major asset, including parastatal companies. In this regard, the Commission feels that it is government's obligation to provide certain services, such as uh, they're talking about, to provide certain services such as energy, communication, banking, health, to mention but a few to the public, which would otherwise not be provided if the company is currently providing such services when private hands. So there's a suggestion that certain a line of certain economic activities should be undertaken by government. Yeah. yeah. This is the recommendation. The commission, this is 2005 we're talking wow. about. Yeah. The commission recommends that the constitution should provide that any measure, any, any measure to sell, transfer, or dispose of major public assets such as parastatos shall require approval of the National Assembly from a resolution supported by not less than two thirds of the MPs. Wow. This is 2005. Gambians are concerned. And they're saying any sale of any assets, transfer of shares, whatever, go back to parliament. Go back to parliament, whatever happens. Then when the president sat appointed a technical committee, the te technical committee also came up with the same uh, same conclusion. Now, in the in the uh, Mungomba Constitution Commission, they introduced the Article 315 in the draft constitution, which says any major asset, such as a parastatal company or a commercial enterprise of the state, shall not be sold or transferred or disposed of except with the prior resolution of the National Assembly supported by a vote of not less than two thirds of all the members of the National Assembly. Homopani sale falls in this category. It falls in this category because what has happened is this government owns this entity 100%. What has happened? It has transferred that. Okay? That company is technically owned by another company. Okay? What is the difference between 49% and 10%? There's no difference. You're still a minority shareholder yeah. anyway. Okay? The one with 51% controls. And in fact, that is exactly what is happening on the ground anyway in mm Mopani. -hmm. And if you go find out further, you will actually discover that, in fact, there is actually a parallel management which has been introduced to Mopani. Mm -hmm. But as you have the existing management, Delta has brought it's on, it's on, it's on people who own the assets now. Exactly. Mm. But what say they are concerned? So a deal like this required government mm. approval of the National Assembly. There is another point which people seem to, to, to ignore, which is the fact that you see, when you have uh, a license, yeah. okay, there is a provision under the Mines and Minerals Development Act. Right. Mm -hmm. First, you can when you have a license the way it uh, has, you cannot undertake any reorganization internally, which will result in a new person having more than fifty percent of the shares without a ministerial approval. Okay, this is contained in section sixty-seven of the mines. Uh, a Zeros Development Act. It says a holder of a mining right or mineral processing license shall not, after the date of the grant of the license, without the prior written approval of the minister, register the transfer of any shares or of any share or shares in the company to any person or that person nominee if the effect of doing so will give that person. So the sales can't be sought without approval of the ministry. This Kabusway granted this permission. Why? Because they recognize that there is now a transfer. A new person is going to control this mine. Mm. ZCCM was going to lose control over Mupani. Mm. This particular provision was complied with. Okay? Or there's another scenario, or enter into an agreement with any person if the effect of doing so would give the person control. What is control? It says here, 
Uh, for purposes of this section, that person is deemed to have control of a company. If that person or that person's nominee or either person or that person's nominee together, a total of 50% or more of the equity shares of the company. Yeah. Okay. So I don't say council, the law, state council, the law is very clear. The law is fine. You need monster's approval. Yes, maybe that's the right. But you need two thirds majority in, par in parliament. Yes. You can't bypass that. You can't bypass. And the rationale is very simple. And that is why, for example, we have too many questions about this transaction. Okay. There were other people, for example, that you have referred to. Now, members of parliament needed to understand how did you end up with Delta? Yeah, why have you abandoned West abandoned Sibanya Water and yes. these others? Yes. Where has international resource holdings, which now register Delta, yes. come from? What's up? My name is Ken Dumbo, the MC with the source. Don't forget to subscribe to Jeku. Constitutes this local Delta. Who is a local shareholder? Who are they? Who are they? And all this thing is designed for purposes of transparency. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that the, because at the end of the day, look at this saga with KCM. We are suffering. The Zambians that are oh, suffering. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now these assets are supposed to benefit the people. And the best way to do it is to say, what is the rationale behind taking the issue to the National Assembly? Because this is where the people's representatives. MPs represent the people in their respective constituencies. And you would have expected the MPs on the Copper Belt and Northwestern Province to lead the matter to be part of this discussion because these minds exist in their constituencies so that they have an input, so that they know how Delta has ended up being the, the, the selected uh, entity to take successful the interest. Mm -hmm. yeah. All these things, you know what? They are necessary for purposes of it. Could be that this is a clean deal, we don't know that, okay. But also, don't say, Council, in fact, this brings me to um, this question every time we raise these concerns in the manner you've expressed them, and you've expressed them in a more lucid manner than any of us, I think, have done the concerns around the constitution. Is this illegality very serious? Part of the constitution is. is it an infraction we can ignore because the deal is good? No, you can't. You see, here is a problem. If I may just, uh, uh, if let's see, Article, uh, Article 210 it says, subject to approval, it's not ratification, but approval. So before you complete this deal. They have to approve. You need to have approval of the National Assembly. Okay? Now, it's only when you have approval, that's when you complete. It's, ref it's different from ratification. Ratif ratification, you can conclude. And then and you get just comes later. Later. Mm -hmm. Okay? In this case, it's approval. It's approval. You have to do it. These are what we call condition precedents. You could have obtained parliamentary approval before concluding this deal. Okay. Now, there is a constitutional omission. Now, Article 1 clearly says that any act or omission that contravenes the Constitution, that act, it says, if I may just read it expressly, it says, Article 1, 2 says, an act or omission that contravenes this Constitution is illegal. Full stop. No matter how sweet the deal is, no matter how much it favors the people of Ikwe uh, and Vasilika, it's illegal. Now, there is a problem with this. Delta should have ensured that before they concluded, comply with the constitutional problem. Will, will they sort of taken over by government because of this provision? Ambassador, yes. If you've got a new government, for example. Mr. Kensa, this is an illegal contract. Okay. Now, the reason why there is always need, even if you are in doubt, wisdom will dictate to say, you know what, let's err on the side of caution. Let's go to National Assembly. You yeah. have no problem. Okay? It's better to do that. Unless these are malicious. No, they would not have refused. Yeah. The yeah. Nobody can tank a deal like this. It's a fantastic deal. What is beyond comprehension is why they didn't take it to the National Assembly. And even when you ask them to explain, for some reason, they can't even explain it. 
what is even worse, the attorney, the learned attorney general is asked, they said, this deal is illegal. He says, no, no, it's not illegal. It's okay. But if you have a problem, go to court. No, that is again not understanding your role as an attorney general. An attorney general, you are not a cadre. You are attorney general for the Republic of Zambia. What the attorney general needed to do was to explain why, in his opinion, there was no requirement to take the issue to the National Assembly. We could have had a debate on that. And we have heard from what the minister has been saying. He says, no, this is a subscription, it's share subscription, it's, it's just mere transfer to circumvent the provisions of the law. Yeah, but, but even then, that is unsuccessful because Article 2 point is very broad. It's very, very broad. It simply says, even if you are talking about a transfer, you have, okay, fine, there's no subscription or whatever, but you've transferred yeah. the asset. And Pakra documents show the ownership has changed. Exactly. Later to date and sell these assets. Exactly. Because so the assets are mortgaged anyway. Yeah. Right. So all these things, in any case, what was so difficult, what would they have lost if I thought they had gone to? Yes, because we will no doubt revamp Tito and Muslima. To no doubt revamp. Mm -hmm. But to be just, I mean, here's the situation. Before 2016, uh, we went to court. The court ruled that uh, President Lungu is eligible. Right? Mm -hmm. It's happened. There's a change of government, the matter is back in court. So this deal risks exactly so, so is the problem. Mm. Okay, the next mm. government will say, listen, we are constitutionalists, we are for rule of law. This deal did not meet uh, the requirement of the law. Of the law. And they can go to court and unbundle it to say, okay, this is an illegal contract. And then you start unraveling it. Okay, so it was incumbent upon parties. These are the things that you tick, tick, tick. The, the presidential jet bought at $120 million, refurbished with technical specs, it went to almost $200 million. Is it a major national asset? Because we understand the person has refused to use that plane. He's put it on the line that he's selling it. Does it fall in the realm of a major it asset? Does. It does. It's, it's an asset. If you see, if you go to the document saying ownership, yeah. whose name and who has them? Yeah. GRZ. Yeah, Subway Force, yes. Okay, so you cannot sell it the way you sell your own car, okay? And also, the, the, the point is that there is a misconception about the president and uh, on the part of the president uh, over the jet. Yeah. The jet belongs to the republic. It's a national asset. It's a national asset. Whether you like it or you don't like it, it's an asset of the, of the Republic. You have no right to sell it, okay? You can decide not to use it, that's your choice, but you can't sell it. You cannot therefore say, well, I don't like it, what, what, what? Ah, it's already been paid for anyway. Mm. But in any case, it would even be irresponsible to sell it because you cannot recover the kind of money that you spent. Yeah. Logic, if somebody is uh, really financially disciplined, common no sense will say, use it. Because that jet that they are using is an older uh, jet. So I don't know what the cost of maintenance is and so forth. That is a more modern, I mean, we're talking about the, what is a gap of 30 years? Mm -hmm. The challenge was bought when? In uh, what? Maybe 20? No, it's, it's a little than 50 year old. Yes. But, but then we, bought, we bought it was 30 years ago. That's right. Mm. Now, can you imagine how technology has improved in the last 50 years? Okay. So obviously, the new plane, the Gulf Stream, is it 600? Mm -hmm. It's a far more efficient uh, jet. Now, if you are really conscious, I mean, you are to, you are president of a country that is bankrupt. Why would you refuse to use an asset that has already been paid for? Yeah. Yes, there you may have issues. The issue is not the plane. The issue is what you think was paid for, mm -hmm. which you believe is a, is a, is a, is a exorbitant. Can do with that separately. With that, it has nothing. Yes, it has nothing to do with the asset. If you believe that, well, you should have paid fifty million dollars, but you guys, you took the two top soup, and uh, you, you, you. What is the term for it? Something was just. check it out. Was too much. You to to that or something. Mm. There's nothing wrong with the, with the jet. There's nothing wrong. The problem is that if you have evidence to say other people profiteered from uh, 
uh, from the transaction. You follow those and recover the money. But, you, the, but the solution is not uh, to sell the asset. That would be uh, irresponsible to do mm. that. Mm. Yeah. Also, I think thank you for the clarification. Do you have any comments about KCM? I see you, you, you've dealt comprehensively with the latest issue of the money. Yes. I think you've directed both the public and the country on the state of Botani, a good deal, sadly, an illegal deal. That's right. And it's no cure other than parliamentary approval. That's right. Which they can still do, which they can still do. And retrospect. Yes. They, no, no, no. They have to find a way. I mean, if you put together, I mean, they are very expensive lawyers, and I'm sure they can find a solution to make sure that they comply with the Zambian constitution. Yeah. It is imperative that yeah. they comply with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Remember what happened to Lab Green when Mr. Sata took office? Yes, he just uh, something. He just took over it. Yeah. He says the deal was illegal. It not reach the, yeah. the compliance issues. Are, exactly. Took over. What's up? My name is Ken Dumbo, the MC with the sauce. Don't forget to subscribe to Jeku. Here we are talking about violation of the constitution, which is even far greater infraction. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can't sacrifice because the deal is good. Therefore, you say. Uh, in a commercial sense, it doesn't give you license to violate the constitution. Okay, even if it is, no matter how good it is, you just have to comply with the law. And that's why when you listen to these guys to say we are for rule of law, mm. rule of law means respecting the law even when it is inconvenient. It's not about circumventing the law. Mm. If the law says you go to the National Assembly, you go to the National Assembly. And you now have the task to convince the other opposition members why this deal is okay. The president has given us some, some set of mindset. It seems to be frustrated by bureaucratic procedures and constitutional requirements like this. He has expressed this of procedures. He wants the end, end result. Does this justify the end? It doesn't. I mean, if let's say you don't have that patience to respect the law, then you shouldn't be in government. Yeah. Okay, you should be in the private sector. But even in the private sector, there is also things like so that. Yes. And that is why, for example, we have a problem where the president gives instruction to Cisco managing director do this ABC. It's lawlessness. Okay? Employee okay. misses. You, you can't. That's lawlessness. You can't. Okay? The only people that can give instruction to Cisco MD is the board of Cisco. Okay, the president cannot override the board. And these are the problems that we have in our parastatos, you know, and these problems, they continue. Even people that claim to know you have been a standard businessman. I mean, it's very basic about how companies should operate. Orlando, the president came from Dubai and he says, uh, is it true when he came from Qatar? He said, I've come along with investors and he summoned, uh, you know, uh, management of uh, <laughs> First, as we are on the left, and he chaired the meeting and directed that they should ensure that the agreements are complete. That's the best. The entire purchase agreement is signed. That's the honest. And straight for the MD. I suppose him and his management is going to refuse. And if, for example, this investor would say, Sell you power when you set up this solar plant. We sell you at 18 cents. You know, if you say, yes. if the president does that, that's right. That's right. That's why the president should never get involved into these things. Okay. I mean, there are always rules. Even if you talk about uh, the Zesco, um, companies like Zesco, are still limited liability companies, mm -hmm. and they are governed by the provisions of uh, of the Companies Act. There are rules to follow, even if you are president, you know. But these are problems that follow you once you leave office, unfortunately, you know. But the rules are there. Mm -hmm. You choose to break them at your own peril. Okay, so these are the challenges. Our biggest problem in as as Zambia is basically. I think we are just a lawless people. The rules are very clear. If we settle for what the rules follow, maybe half of our problems will be all yeah. away. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. You see, it's a typical situation. If you have a small contender, you employ somebody, you tell him to say, okay, this is where you record the sales. The moment you see the guy stops recording, you know he's a thief. Mm -hmm. What is he doing? He's breaking the controls. Mm -hmm. And then create confusion because you can't steal if systems are working. Systems are broken deliberately so that people can steal, mm -hmm. you know? So rule of law does not favor thieves. It doesn't, unfortunately, you know? So when you find people resisting to follow them, there is a problem. 
oh, this government doesn't own large-scale tender you know. processes, whether it's fertilizer or any large procurement. Mm. I've opted for, you know, uh, mechanisms that actually just favor them. Mm. I would be doing, there's a lot of lawlessness yes. going on. So, yeah. mm, do you have any thoughts on before? CM is a fiction. Mm. Okay, mm. whatever I uh, I know matters are in court, uh, but um, they I have my misgivings. I don't think at all in its current state, CM will ever come to life. I doubt it. And whatever people are trying to cook, uh, it is really a fiction. I know there are attempts to to end into what they call um, a scheme of arrangement with creditors and uh, with creditors. But the, what does that mean, scheme of creditors? What debt is on, on KCM? You appear to put a mail on Scotland like it would come up. Because it's a company with uh, some of the largest uh, property deposits in the world, the one under Concola Deep. It does, it does, but you need money to be able to realize those uh, things. Uh, let me say this. I I know President Lung made many mistakes, but if there is a, the worst mistake of his presidency was the decision to take over KCM. I know people don't want to hear this. That's the true position. Uh, the manner in which this was taken, okay? First of all, it was illegal. It was illegal. Uh, I know people have said bad things about Vedanta and everything else. Yes, but they not have been following the law. But you can also, you cannot break the law. You another wrong, okay? Even the way it was, first of all, I grew up in, you know, on the copper belt and I followed the privatization. Mining is not an easy business to carry out. And as you have seen from the report of the Monarch, of the Mumba Constitution Commission, Pastetos failed because of the ineptitude, hate, and theft by people that were running it. Now, you go and take a major asset like KCM, which requires huge amounts to run. Okay? Now, I don't believe government has capacity to run a business. I don't. And I don't believe that there should even be entities like IDC. Okay, I believe all the entities under IDC should simply be privatized. Okay, because I don't believe that government has a role to play in business. Oh, business in business. Uh, yes, like mm. uh, Dr. Chiluba, you used to say, government has no business in business. Mm. We have that experience of parastatus. They failed and they ran down this country. Now, coming to more specifically to KCM, yes, there were wrongs done. But why were the wrongs done, Reverend Dante? It's very simple. We did not enforce the laws. Our biggest problem is the inability to enforce the laws. We advise on the panel yes. that these are proposals by the investor that I'll bring $620 million or $400 million must be followed. It must be followed. So what I'm saying, the paper looks good, the, the, the deal looks good on paper, we have to follow it up, okay? Now, these are the problems, because again, instead of following up, our people get bribed, and then we'll forget about it. Now, that should not be the case. We should be open for uh, business to foreign investors, but they must respect our laws. They must follow yeah. as well. Yes, when there is an agreement, they should follow that agreement. Now, KCM was in a bad state. But what has happened is that I would apportion the blame to both the PF government and the UPND government. Now, why do I say so? The reason is very simple. President Lung should not have taken over KCM in the first place. And that fiction of putting up a liquidator was a fiction. That was a clear illegality. You cannot put a liquidator under those circumstances. Okay? And secondly, even the way it was done, when you apply for liquidation, 
First of all, they should, there was no cause to put in a provisional liquidator. It should have been, there was no cause because that is again a problem that was created by the courts because there was no justification to put in a provisional liquidator. If I told there was no provisional liquidator, the history of KCM would have been totally different. Now, when you have a provisional liquidator, your job is to kill the company. As a liquidator? Yes, it's not to run it. That's your job. You are liquidating. You are killing it. Food, you are killing yes, it. you are killing it. <laughs> because the argument initially by ZCCM was that, well, uh, we can't get along, and then later on they changed that and said, well, you are insolvent. And if you are insolvent, that is the reason for you to go out of business. Insolvency means you are not able to meet your liabilities as and when they fall due. So you can't be allowed to trade. Okay? So you have to be put down. Now, what happened to the liquidator? He started trading. What should have happened is there should have been no mining. What's up? My name is Ken Dumbo, the MC with the sauce. Don't forget to subscribe to Jayku. No smelting, nothing. There should have been no activity whatsoever at KCM. The only thing that should have been there is simply to protect the asset until you find a buyer for it. Okay? But what happened? The liquidator started trading. It's never the job of a liquidator to trade. It is a job of a receiver, not the job of a liquidator. Liquidator is to liquidate, is to kill. What happened? Mopani's financial position worsened during the period. Ambassador, I'm sorry to say this, all those people that were involved in the Mopani transaction, I look at them as enemies of this country. They were KCM. Mm -hmm. KCM. KCM. All those people involved in KCM were mm -hmm. enemies of the state. Because whatever they did was simply terrible. First of all, the liquidator is never paid based on the revenue that is being generated because he shouldn't be trading. He gets paid when he sells the asset. All those, I know the agreements that were signed, all those agreements are illegal. They are all illegal. Ordinarily, if we're really serious, if we're really serious, all those people involved in the SEM saga should all be in jail because the damage they have done to this country is incalculable. Because what happened, even though the liquidator was trading, do you know that he couldn't even maintain to meet, to meet his obligations? Government had to pump in more money into KCM. I mean, where, on what planet does that, is that even feasible? Okay? But what has happened... That is the problem. So that should not have happened. Yeah. UPND, when you look at the liability of KCM in 2021, or 2021. it is not what it is today. The blame for UPND is time they have taken to resolve this issue. In fact, it's not even resolved. But in the meantime, has the liquidator also proceeded to trade? It's, it's, to it's, it's, still, it's still the same illegality going on. Okay? So in the meantime, the financial position of KCM is worse. Okay? Now, by some estimates, you're talking about liabilities of uh, this account confirmed but from third party sources. I've not confirmed this, but, uh, but some people, by some accounts, they're saying the liabilities of KCM are well in excess of two billion plus. Before you even start operations, this is person from Gone. Right? Now, you need to inject. No money now to finish all those shafts to start operation. Again, it is estimated that another maybe one or two billion dollars. We're talking about something like maybe three, four billion dollars. With three, four, five billion dollars, I'll go and start another mine. A new mine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, who are the major creditors? You have your ZRA, you have your Zesco, you have your CUC, you have uh, NAPSA. And so forth. And you know, our suppliers and contractors. That's right. But the suppliers are a small portion. Okay. So, what is, I don't believe, Dr. Sishua Sishua issued a public statement. 
he said they had gotten wind of the argument by the CMH and um, uh, and uh, the banter. And he said, from his estimation, that deal, that agreement of handing over back, uh, you know, uh, Cosium to Vedanta was criminal. He said similar words of views that whoever is involved in this has actually committed treason. He then challenged the Minister of uh, Lines and Minerals Development, Honorable Pokabu. So he said, if I am lying, if my source is not credible, publish the argument you have just signed between the CMIH and Vedanta. Yeah. Mm. My allegation that you mm. have sold the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have joined them in demanding that that agreement be signed, but we seem to have repeated uh, the mistakes. Yes. In the game, we've never even signed a worse off deal. I don't know what is contained in that deal. Nobody knows, and that is why when you have this, and I think this comes to when you elect people don't really understand their role. Okay? When you're a minister, you work for the people. If the people demand this, you make it available. You don't hide. Because this, this is public information. If you have nothing to hide, then why can't you disclose it? But remember, like we are saying, we are suffering from the ramification of whatever these government officials, decisions which they make. Now, why can this information be made publicly available? Okay, nobody has seen that transaction. And all what we have now, you now have uh, somebody cooking up some... Uh, I know the matter is in because somebody's cooking up some scheme of arrangement. Even the scheme of arrangement, there is no provision in the law for a legal writer for a scheme of arrangement with creditors. There is no such a provision. It is provided for. What is provided for? First of all, you do not put a company under the control of a liquidator. His mandate is very simple. Wait. Okay? Very simple. It's then the Corporate Insolvency Act. And there is no provision. So your mandate, you don't have that mandate. The scheme of arrangement can be done by the company itself. Okay? By the manager. manager. No, by the creditor. In the name of the company. Okay? It's so, okay, fine. Look, can we enter into a deal uh, with, uh, with uh, the other creditor so that we see how we can pay them out? Now, in this case, technically, that company, the KCM, it's actually use, abusing the shield of liquidation to keep away the creditors because, they, because there are people <laughs> holding judgments against Cassians. <laughs> the moment the liquidators out, they bounce. That is abuse. That is not what liquidation is intended for. It is intended for till. It's an orderly way for you to exit, stop existing. It is not meant to revive you. Okay? So that is where the problem is. The foundation is illegal, and whatever has been done subsequently is still illegal. That is why I have my misgivings about its, um, its uh, viability. And in my opinion, having known that what was done at the, by the PF government was illegal, at the very least, I expected UPND to resolve this issue within maybe three, four, three to six months after coming to power. By that time, the burden of KCM was less. Because remember, this thing is going every day. It's growing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It has to come to out. It to come out. And you're not paying. Mm -hmm. Okay? Maybe then, that's your timing is very important in business. Okay, and even these guys who claim to know business, they should know that. So that is where my misgivings come from. But for, between the two deals, the one is a far much better deal, so for the illegality. Yeah. Yeah. But KCM is also another illegal transaction that is being uh, sold uh, as a successful deal. It's not. And these are the consequences of not respecting the law. The law is very clear. Stick to the law. You can save. Yeah. And when you don't speak to stick to the law, the consequences to the country are enormous. And this is what we are suffering from. Oh, good. Before I let you go, there's an issue of governance. Um, the Minister of um, Home Affairs held a, uh, a press conference. We were talking about um, you know, the United Culture Alliance. He said it's illegal. 
some illegal entity has called it, and you know, literally it should not exist. Uh, you want to solicit for your opinion. You might not have prepared on this, but I would like you to think on top of your head. Have these um, bans uh, uh, statements, public statements against governance, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly? Okay. Does a political alliance require even registration? What does the law say? Ambassador, we have an um, uh, which is in the Constitution. It provides for freedom of assembly and association. We can assemble under any umbrella. Nowhere does it say you need for you to come in as an alliance, you need to be registered. There is no such a requirement. But there's a requirement for political parties to be registered. Okay? But if we band the three of us to say we are forming an alliance, there is no requirement under the law to say we should be registered, okay? So, but the overriding concern is that the three of us, we have met the requirements under the Societies Act because we are a registered political party, but there is no law which says that an alliance should be registered. I do know that uh, uh, there is a provision um, under the proposed Political Parties Act where an alliance was requ is required to be registered but that, to the best of my recollection, that that uh, that uh, that is simply proposed. It's in a bill. It's not yet law. Okay. So, but if in play, if that act comes into place, it means that all the political parties registered under the society's name will begin to have been registered under the political parties, and then they'll be able to follow that. Now. People don't really understand this. As a citizen, I have the right to do everything that I can think of. You cannot, or unless the law stops me from doing it. But as government, you cannot do anything unless you're empowered by law to do something. Mm -hmm. The converse. That is why we have laws. Mm -hmm. So the law must stop me. If it doesn't stop me, then it means I have the freedom to do that. There is no law which says that an alliance must be registered. Okay, there isn't. Okay, and in any case, how can something be an illegal entity? Okay, now how do you become an entity? You become an entity because you are registered under some law. So if I'm not registered under some law, it means I'm not an entity. Yeah. It can, I cannot be illegal because it doesn't exist at law. You know, these are some of the problems that, uh, you know, people should be able, even ministers, I mean, I, I have a rule. Never open your mouth and chew unless you have checked the law. You see? Even you who's a lawyer. <laughs> that's why, Ambassador, you never catch me. I can never say something. That's why I brought all these things so that yeah. I don't rely on my memory. Unless I misspeak or whatever, I mislead myself. I bring the documents that I think can guide me. Very simple because that is not what I think it should be. It is what is on the paper. So if the minister says uh, it's, a, it's an illegal entity, it's not an entity. What makes it an entity? Yeah. Okay. For example, for companies, they are registered under the Companies Act. So a political party is under the Societies Act. So if you are not registered under any of these instruments, you are not an entity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can't declare something to be an illegal entity which does not exist. The UPND alliance itself, yes, it's an alliance is it registered? It's not registered. It's not it's even linked to us. For example, it's like you and I, you say we come together to say, you know what, let's do work out something to put our own interest. As long as we don't purport that this is a legal entity, okay. Okay, nobody has suggested that we upwa. Uka, or is it Ukwa or Uka? Uka. It's a legal entity. He has never said that. Okay, and we all know Uka has never been registered. Therefore, it is not a legal entity. So how can it be described as an illegal entity? You know, so if it is not an entity, therefore, it cannot be expected to comply with the provisions of the law. I think what is required in this case is the individual political parties possibly to inform the police Again, Ambassador, I was reluctant to, to comment about this because I don't know what these people in Uta have actually done. Yeah, true. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there's a requirement if you're going to come together as political parties 
inform the police. So they did actually inform the police. Uh, it never noticed under their individual political parties. I'm aware that that is it's it's enough. And government parties it's that submitted the report. That is enough. These are registered agencies. Yes, and they're entitled. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, we have an overriding provision in the Constitution, which is the Bill of Rights, which guarantees each and every one of us freedom of assembly and association. Okay, we can assemble as individuals, we can also assemble as political parties. Nothing stops us from doing that. And it is then the constitution, which is the supreme law of the land. Yeah. Okay, so Ambassador, if our colleagues in, uh, in uh, uh, Oasis Forum have the money, yeah. I think they should carry out. They have to do. <laughs> no, they have to. Right. Uh, I think they have to carry out civic education mm. for all cabinet ministers. They should start with residents, <laughs> including the president, by the way. Yeah. Give them civic education. Yeah. And we have training on, on what the constitution provides. Yeah. I think that is what is needed. And uh, I, I propose the IRA as a resource. No, no, no. Right. Energetic. So that is what we need. To do in this country's re primary requirement, ambassador, is less stick to the law. Yeah. Less yeah. respect the law. In fact, Council, I am looking forward to inviting you. We are celebrating, is it Diamond Jubilee? Yes, yeah, year. Uh, what have we done wrong? What could we have done better? Yes. Yes. As we march towards the next 60 years. Mm. I want you to mm. to come and have a discussion. Mm. What's wrong with our country? Yeah. Yeah. Because we seem to be proposing solutions to problems we've not even identified. That's exactly the So point. I hope that you will find... Okay. I think it is an important historical event because what has happened is that we have basically atrophied as a country. We were one of the richest countries at independence. We have moved into the poorest country in Africa, in the world. How do you explain that in 60 years? Okay, that is a tragedy. And that is what is required. So we shouldn't actually be celebrating. We have nothing to celebrate. We should use this as a time of reflection. Sacred reflection. Okay, mm -hmm. for us to understand what have we gotten wrong in the last 60 years. Okay, because what are you going to celebrate? Drought, road shedding, oh, huh? road shedding, unemployment, disease, terror, mm, corruption, corruption. What well, is that to celebrate? What is that? And then you have just had uh, your debt restructured because you can't. Uh, yeah. You've already suspended the payment from today yes. to a future end. Yes. But what is that to celebrate? What is that to celebrate? So, well, un 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 uh, unemployment is the highest it has ever been. Oh. You can't even. We can't even. I mean, what we have spent, I'm not trying to preempt uh, what your plan discussion. I think our biggest problem is we are trying to address the symptoms and not the problems. When we look at the issue, we just had a cholera. People ask their family members. Cholera is not a problem. It's a symptom of a problem. You exaggerate the way it is going up like a yo-yo. It's not a problem. It is a symptom of a problem. The drought that we're experiencing is not, and the fact that there is now a potential starvation, it's not a problem. It is a symptom of a problem. Red shading is not a problem. All these things that we're talking about, Ambassador, they're not problems. They are symptoms. Okay? So I hope we'll be able to spend time to reflect what is the real cause? And you and unless we identify the real cause, we're just going to spend another 60 years, we you and I will no longer be there with uh, to, leaving our children and our children's children to live in object poverty. For instance, there is now this cause where we are saying President HH uh, has failed, right? I would put my hand up and say, it failed. You have to go beyond that. Let's not just, first of all, failure of any president should not be celebrated. It's a collective failure. It's a collective failure. It means that as a people, we made a bad choice. In any case, when we fail, 
we are, we are facing the consequences of that failure. The 20 million Zambians are suffering, are paying for the consequences of that failure. So we shouldn't celebrate that. We shouldn't celebrate the fact that HHS has failed to run this country. What we should now, we should go beyond acknowledging the fact that he has failed. We should now begin to interrogate and ask ourselves, why has he failed? Which we don't do. Okay, we kicked out Lungo. Okay, Lungo has failed. But we didn't pause for a moment. Why did Lungo fail? Because if we had done that interrogation, perhaps the outcome of the election would have been different. Now, let's seize this opportunity before 2026 but and understand why has the church failed so that we make sure that we put safeguards for the next election, for the next president that is likely to be elected, so that he doesn't make the mistakes that the HH has made. Yeah, you are a ripe candidate for my reflection. I want to have uh, various um, conversations um, at Diamond uh, 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 Jubilee, you know, of uh, 60 years. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the Diamond investor requires this moment of reflection. I also heard the view that celebrations, like we do, we turn serious sacred issues into events. Yeah. It will pass. Yes. We even put up banners. Mm. The banner mm. bill. We we'll say we are 60 years, we are happy. Mm. 60 years, and we walk our way back to the same point. Why are you celebrating, Ambassador? Yeah. You should celebrate some milestones that you have achieved. Yeah. What have you achieved? What's up? My name is Ken Dumbo, the MC with the sauce. Don't forget to subscribe to Jayco. Can, are you able to name one sector, one aspect of this country which is performing? No, no. Is there any sector that is healthy in this country? Mm. You think everything is dead. Okay. Mm. So mm. what is there to celebrate? Mm. If there is any money to be spent on those so-called uh, celebrations, I would advise you don't even spend that kind of money because you don't even have the money anyway because you are broke. Okay. And that is why even the idea of saying, oh, Let's have a, a new roadmap. It's crazy. Let's have priorities. We should be able to reflect why are we where we are after 60 years of independence. Yeah. We must have so that when we enter into the 2025, we must have an answer to that question. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, to my dear viewers, we were privileged to host uh, Mr. John Sangwa, State Council, renowned lawyer in this country, constitutional lawyer, academic uh, 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 lecturer, and uh, public commentator on various, various issues, and is a voice of light, voice of guidance for our country. And that's why he came, he speaks candidly as it is. So uh, my, my role is just to thank you for this opportunity, Mr. Sangwa, and thank you for sparring this time once again. Ambassador, it's always my privilege because uh, I hold the Constitution very dear to my heart. So whenever I have an opportunity to talk about these things, uh, I don't miss that opportunity. So I think the privilege is also mine that you have accorded me this platform. Thank you very much. You directed that the booklet should be distributed to every school, to every public place of our Constitution. Yes. That's how important a guide and light it is to our country it but is. we don't take it uh, as such we don't take it we don't i mean even the curriculum they should maybe part of the reflection of the 60 years is to see how do we inculcate the constitutional values into the younger generation the older generation they lost cause anyway so those are already damaged anyway and for the younger ones coming i think we have to reflect on the uh, curriculum to make sure that we instill mm -hmm. this sense of pride in the constitution. They should have a sense of ownership of this constitution and accept its sacredness mm -hmm. because it provides the foundation of who we are. Okay. So I hope we'll reach there. Yes, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I promise you, uh, 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 State Council will be back on the reflection of the 60 years of according time to prepare and reflect. You know, when he comes here, he comes loaded with a bazooka like he did today. So until next time and until we have another special guest, God bless Zambia. God bless our country. God bless you. Shalom, shalom.
Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, J Cool, and turn on the notification bell, cause I'm gonna see you in the next video.